Hi, uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, this conference has been awesome, and I'm honored, honored to be a part of it at all. Um, oh, all right. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is simplifying the data layer uh, and some approaches that have worked well and things I've worked on uh, and some other ideas looking forward, uh, kind of in the spirit that Chris talked about in his keynote. So I work at Twitter, I work in the Boston office, and I work on uh, the team that makes Fabric, our developer tools platform. Specifically, I work on a product called Answers uh, that's a mobile analytics product. So this helps app developers find out things like how many users are in their app, what they're doing, how often they're experiencing crashes, that kind of thing. We adopted React in production about nine months ago, uh, and it's been awesome. Uh, React and its community have really taken these ideas that were a little bit on, on the edge about functional programming, uh, things like recording things as data, um, interpreting them differently, uh, using functions and emphasizing composition, and really brought them to the mainstream. It's been awesome. So this has really helped us in the view layer uh, be more productive. The data layer has still a bunch of challenges with it. Uh, and so here's, here's, I think, where we have a really big opportunity as this community um, to take the simplicity of React, where we have set state and render, and try to apply that same simplicity to some of these hard problems uh, that people have talked about earlier. Um, Joe talked about this, Lee talked about this, uh, and Dan and Nick are going to talk about this later uh, with Relay and GraphQL. And I think this is an area where work uh, can really have a big impact. So today, I'm going to talk basically in two parts. One is about my experience working on answers, how we've worked to collabor uh, collaborate across parts of the stack to make a really impactful, real-time user experience, uh, and how on the UI side, uh, we've used sort of classic functional programming ideas uh, with uh, recording things as data and then interpreting them so that we can push effects to the edge. In the second half, I want to talk a little bit more forward-looking, uh, taking some inspiration from some back-end systems and how they work and how we can apply them to the UI. This is something that's worked really well in past projects that I've worked on, and I think is an inspiring direction to look towards. OK. So collaborating across the stack. To set some context, this is basically how Answers works. Uh, there's a bunch of phones out there in the world, and they're running apps, like maybe the awesome React Europe app. And as things are happening, they'll send up events uh, to our back end. And the back end is not a single server. It's not one bo uh, box that's a black box. It's a huge distributed system. There's clusters of computers talking to other clusters of computers. And at the far end of this distributed system, there's some browsers, and there's some users, and there's some humans actually using this data. And so this is the kind of thing uh, that people might see using this product. They might see a visualization showing, ah, uh, showing uh, how many users are in their app right now. Uh, and this is really impactful. This like, creates an emotional engagement with a product that is really hard to like, overstate. Uh, when you're sitting there developing and you open your phone and you open your app that you're working on, and within seconds you see this number moving, uh, it really engages people. Uh, but it's clear, like looking and working on these kind of systems, that we have to acknowledge that there's some latency inherent in this system. We can't sort of assume we can get, a data, get data from the server and keep a static snapshot of it. It doesn't work. Um, in the back end, events are coming in, over hundreds of millions of them a minute. And so by the time we even get a response back, even if it's 10 millisecond latency, some of that data might already be stale. The other thing this clarifies is it's not about that sort of transport protocol. We can't just connect with a WebSocket and have that solve all our problems. Uh, there's no way we can take all the events that are coming on the server and just stream them down to the browser. The scale is too much. Uh, and so I think this is really interesting because it sort of uh, is a unique problem space that makes it easy to sort of t t uh, think about and talk about the different pieces involved here. So in terms of how we've approached this, uh, on the back end systems, they're basically designed around a Lambda architecture. Um, Lambda functions, again, good functional programming ideas appearing. Uh, the core idea is that as uh, events come into the system, as data comes in, we just record these immutably into a log. Uh, and this works for offline. It works in offline as well. Uh, and then separately from that log, we can compute different views of that data, depending on what we need. And so using this system lets us optimize for product development and feature development. Uh, we try to optimize so that we can make it really fast to make new views of that data uh, to serve whatever product feature that we want to build. And then each of those views can be really individually optimized or tweaked, uh, depending on what the, the product needs and what the user impact is of that engineering work. 
And so on the UI side, uh, this means that all the API calls are really fast, uh, and there's some element of eventual consistency throughout this system that we have to acknowledge. Um, with all that data coming through the front door, uh, it's, we can't sort of have a naive uh, view that like when we make a request, everything's gonna always be immediately up to date. Uh, there's more details in a blog post uh, that one of my colleagues, Ed, worked on if you're curious about this. So the impact for this on UI engineering is by talking about this stuff and really socializing these ideas across the team, across different parts uh, of how the system works, we can more explicitly bound the latency that different parts of the system need. So this part of the, the system up top, this, this feature where we're showing in real time how many users are in the app, has really strict requirements. To, in order for the, the time from a user do it, does this on their phone uh, to show up in here, in order for that to be seconds, uh, that needs to be really, really engineered. Other parts of the system that have aggregate views or sort of roll up or higher level things or are below the fold don't need quite that level of, uh, of real timeness. Everything here is, is very real time. Nothing is more than a minute. Um, but there's a big difference between the engineering effort required to make something on the order of five seconds and required to make something on the order of 30 or 60 seconds. Uh, so this lets us be intentional and orient and focus around the user impact of this work. Cool. So when it comes to the UI, and we're making our JavaScript, uh, this is all you know, JavaScript code in the front end. Uh, when we're making that, uh, we can use this sort of classic functional programming approach of recording things as data and then interpreting them later to help simplify uh, some of that design. So in looking at a component like this, one question that comes up is how do we describe this? React is really good at saying if you have some data structure describing the state of your UI, you can feed it to a component and it will make that happen in the DOM for you declaratively. But the sort of like guts of this feature um, is really dynamic. Uh, there's not a sort of static view of what state is. Uh, and so in looking about how to do this, we're looking at sort of the awesome work that's happening in Flux and elsewhere in the community um, and seeing, well, some people solve this kind of approach, uh, solve this kind of problem with communicating with the server by having stores and having them act as a read through cache. And that's not a great fit for this model. Uh, or having action creators uh, that respond to an action and then sort of enqueue, uh, perform a request and then enqueue a response to come back to the dispatcher. Uh, and these don't really sort of fit, uh, fit this problem scenario, despite being really great designs. So the way we took, uh, took a crack at, at establishing, uh, the way we took a crack at solving this is basically having a component and using React's awesome lifecycle hooks. This is where we started. Uh, and so here, uh, you can see when this component is mounted, we create a new process object that encapsulates the sort of communication with the server. Uh, and that process object will emit data that the component can then read back into its component state. And when this component unmounts, uh, that process is stopped. So it's very simple. Uh, a benefit is that the component reading this, it's very explicit to see exactly what's going on, what communication is needed. And we take the mechanics of how that process works and we split that out into a class that has a really uh, clear API. When we look to share, uh, share different kind of data across different components, this design can still work. If we have one component, uh, it can spin up a process that it needs. And if we have another component, it can spin up, spin up a process that it needs. But if these two components want to show different views of the same data, then we sort of get into that classic problem. This design works uh, if we keep these isolated, but there's a real opportunity to optimize this here. So let's look at uh, some things that we've done. But first, to connect this back to the sort of broader context of this conference, this is a tweet from Joe Savannah and the Relay team. This is how I think we should be orienting around these problems, especially in the React community. Uh, async is hard, and as much as we can do that as little as possible and push it out to the edge of the system, there's a lot of impact we can have. React does this really well. Your components have a render method, and they return a description of what the DOM should be. So this is what we've done on answers. Uh, components can implement a declare needs method that takes, just like render, props and state, and is a pure function that returns a data structure describing what communication uh, this component needs with the server. And to me, this is the API that I want. This is how I want to be thinking about programs. This is how, if a developer asks me, how does this work, this is what I would tell them in English. Uh, and so just like React lets us write declaratively and think functionally, uh, and then it bridges the gap to make that the reality in the DOM, we can do the same thing here. Uh, so we have an object called the process sync that can take these descriptions of what all the different components need uh, and then make that reality and make that uh, be how, what's actually happening with communication for the server. So some benefits of this are functions are really easy to think about, really easy to factor, test, all this great stuff. 
This example shows a component that needs one type of data from the server. It needs a process getting it information about the top events, about what's happening in that app. Here, I changed it so that this component now needs two different pieces of information depending on what its state it's in. Uh, and it's really clear and easy to express this. If there is a top event, then I also need this other piece of information. And it's co-located with the component. I think this is something that the Relay and GraphQL teams are really like onto something here. This is so powerful. Um, it's easy to reason about. It makes sense in the context of the component. Uh, it's also very easy to test, of course, because it's, uh, it's just a plain function. So to sketch out sort of at a high level what this looks like, a component describes the things that it needs. Uh, this is implemented as a mix-in. It could be a, a wrapper class. That would be awesome, too. We just haven't done that. Uh, and as props and state change, the, what the component needs changes, and that gets sent to the process sync. Inside there, we can interpret that data structure uh, and basically figure out what to do to make that a reality. This reconciler diagram is from one of Chris's uh, blog posts about how the React reconciliation works. It's the same concept. Uh, and so here, this uh, reconciler can figure out there is no process running to meet this component's needs. Let's start it up. As the user navigates, if they find another component that has the same needs from the server, it has the same process that it wants to be running, the reconciler can figure that out and it doesn't need to start up a new one. And as the user navigates and the component tree changes and a new component comes in, if that component needs different data, uh, the reconciler can figure that out and handle the mechanics of starting and stopping processes to make that the reality. So on one side, where we have components, we can stay functional, we can stay declarative, and then we have library code that can bridge the gap between the stateful imperative realities of talking to the network. On the read path, basically processes will have an API where they can be started, they can be stopped, and they emit data in a certain shape. And that will flow through a dispatcher in sort of standard flux style uh, and be kept in a process store. Components can then sideload that as if it's an observable um, and pull it into their component state. Importantly, the process store here, it's not a cache. That's not the point. Um, all it's trying to do is make it so that when a new component comes to life, uh, that it can read the last value that's flowed through the system. There's tons of other applications of this generic idea of making data concrete and then interpreting it to push side effects out. Uh, I'm super excited about all these kind of things that we're talking about in the React community, and I hope that this happens more. There's some really awesome projects here. Okay. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about uh, a log as a data structure. Uh, and this is a little bit forward looking. Uh, this is a little bit, this has been something that's worked really well in the back end and inspired some work, that, inspired by that, and worked well in other projects, but it's not directly tied to what I do day to day now. So, what am I talking about? Uh, basically, I'm talking about when writes come in, we log them down. And then separately, we compute whatever we need from them. Uh, it's a subtle shift, but the fundamental uh, way to think about this is now much more immutable versus writes coming in and just mutating the database with an insert or an update or those kind of actions. And so for the back end, this gives us a lot of strengths. It gives isolation between the different components, uh, sorry, the different computations that are being performed. Uh, they can't interact with each other. Uh, we can swap out computation and do all this kind of amazing stuff to retroactively apply new computation. Uh, and Michael said in his CSS talk yesterday uh, this quote about delaying design, and I think this really embodies that idea, uh, where we can sort of add any computation we want later. Uh, cool. So let's talk about why this matters. Dan, I think, gave as compelling a demonstration as anyone can give yesterday about how this matters for development. Um, this is from his, his talk yesterday, uh, where the monitor uh, component that he's talking about is essentially a log. It's keeping a record of everything, rather than letting it just flow through the dispatcher. This enables things like hot reloading, uh, debugging. Uh, the Flux team has talked about how you can use this to debug user sessions. Uh, really interesting stuff here. Um, and Cheng Lu just talked earlier about how this sort of idea of keeping things declarative, keeping things as data, lets you interpret them separately uh, and sort of do all this kind of awesome Brett Victor stuff uh, and make that real. So for the data layer, this is even more powerful. Um, David Nolan has talked about this from the ClojureScript community uh, with his work for Ohm, about how you, if you can add, uh, you have a, sort of all the tools in React to add on these, these features like undo and redo, uh, it fits really well into the architecture. Uh, and this is not just for developers, not just for our productivity, this is for users, this is for products, this is for businesses. Um, these are things that people want and they expect more and more for anything that we as front end engineers are building. Real time updates, Collaborative editing, uh, working with partial connectivity, these are hard problems, uh, and everybody just expects this more and more. When we can deliver it, we can really give an awesome experience. 
So it's the time of the talk where I talk about to do MVC. Um, and I feel like this is sort of a, I don't know, personality test between what speaker chooses uh, what different to do's on there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let's make this concrete in to do MVC. Here's an example of what a log might look like. Uh, there's a bunch of different actions that have happened. You can see that user actions are recorded here, and then also the fact that uh, some server layer has made a request and gotten a response. All these things are just logged. The last one, to do's list response, might even be coming from some socket or real-time update channel. So in order to do sort of basic things, like find out what the list of to do's are, uh, this is pretty straightforward. We can reduce over this log, we can write a computation that pulls out the last to do's list response and say that's the source of truth. Regardless of anything else that's happened, whatever the last value came from the server, that's the truth. And we can show that to the user. Yeah. Um, we can do more interesting things, like add in optimistic updating. And this doesn't require a different design, it doesn't require a sort of separate part of our system to handle it. Uh, we basically just reduce through the log and we pick out two different kinds of things happening and we merge them together. And this isn't like easy to figure out how to do these kind of merges, uh, but to me this is the kind of programming work we want to put ourselves in a position to do uh, with good designs. Unsync changes is an amazing kind of thing that like, users uh, can really benefit from. If you're working and I'm adding these to-dos, and I've lost connectivity, say, because the conference is very crowded, uh, and I, I don't realize that that hasn't been broadcast out to the world yet, that's really important to the user. Um, and so we can reduce through that log and just pull out the ones that the user has done uh, that haven't yet been acted by the server. Finally, I think this is where we get into things that are really impactful for front-end engineering for product design. When, when we talk about the log, I'm not talking about the log of everything that's happening in the server's sort of authoritative state of truth. When I'm talking about in the UI, I'm talking about what's happening, the log of what's happened in the UI, in just that layer of the system. And that's the system that really touches users the closest. And so we can sort of say, okay, there's server truth, and like eventually we'll just like pull that down. That's cool. But if I'm a user and I add a to-do, and then later the real-time system pushes down an update that someone else has made, if we're working with mutable models and mutable stores, all we can do is blow that away. All we can do is undo the work that the user just did. If we keep the record and the history of all the things happening, when that comes in, it's straightforward to just reduce through this log and pull out, oh, this is a to-do that the user edited. And within 30 seconds, we got a response from the server that overwrote that. Um, persisting timestamps, all that kind of history and metadata is super powerful here. And so we can surface that directly to the user. We can show them, hey, here's a conflict. Uh, and these things are really powerful for people using products. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how this could be real, uh, how we could make this a reality. I think we're, it's not as far away as, as maybe as it seems. So uh, this diagram I showed earlier of backend systems having rights, accepting them and recording them in a log, and then computing views separately, has a lot of similarities to Flux. Uh, the diagram here is from Fluxer on one side, the other side is from Samza, a stream processing framework. And Flux, when action creators fire actions, or when action, actions flow through the system, they go through the central dispatcher, which is like one of those key properties of Flux. And then later, they will update the stores. So this puts us in a really good position to do this. I think this is why uh, David Nolan can talk about undo redo. This is why uh, Dan can talk about all the awesome stuff he did the other day with live reloading. So this is the way we're at, this is the way this works now with dispatchers. They fundamentally have this mutable bit on the side of the stores. Whereas events flow through, stores get mutated in place. As events flow through, stores get mutated in place. And then the events are lost, the history is lost. So instead of mutating state in place, classical function, classic functional programming uh, strategy here, uh, just immut uh, using immutable data and trying to keep more of our system immutable. So instead, uh, we can just you know, use basically the scene that we have with the dispatcher, but record these things into a log. And so the suggestion here is that we make this a first class way, or like what would happen if we made this a first class way to think about things? How else could it make things simpler? Instead of having stores then be mutated in place, we can replace them with reducer functions. And the key difference is these aren't mutated, getting mutated in place. We can compute them from the log at any time. We can swap, we can swap them out. Uh, and we can uh, even push that swapping of computation all the way out to the user to let them swap out how we're, how we're thinking about what's happened in the UI. 
Uh, so Dan talked about this a little bit yesterday, and this is a thing that I, I think is really exciting that's happening more in the React community, talking about the essence of stores being reducer functions. Uh, so I won't talk about it more. Um, but there's lots of great resources here. I'll sort of put links, links in this when I post it so y'all can read about that more if you're curious. All right, to the whiteboard. So how do we make this real? What does this look like? We have a component tree on one side, and we have a log uh, acting in place of the dispatcher here. When user actions occur, components record these facts in the log. And maybe in another part of the system, we have communication with the server using something like the process that I, that I talked about earlier, and that records what communication is happening uh, into the log as well. Let's start really simple and really naive. Uh, there's challenges here, especially with performance. We'll talk about those. But to start, if we just take that log and, and record those things in an array, and we take that list of facts and we set state on the top component, uh, that component can then take that list of facts and thread it all the way down. Uh, should component update is a really good question, uh, but just go with me for a minute. Components then uh, can write code to pull out whatever it is they need. Uh, all the data is available, uh, and they can just write a function or use a function to get whatever it is that they need. Um, one part of the to-do list might want the list of to-dos filtered. Another one might want to express the filters so the user can change them. And because these things are just pure functions, we can split out their definition elsewhere. We don't actually have to write them in the mechanics of how they work in the components. Uh, we can do that separately. And that gives us all the really good properties of functions, like composition, refactoring, and testing. OK, so let's talk about some challenges. Uh, first, I think one question is, like, is this a, a really good building block for sort of building different pieces of a data system? Um, I'm pretty convinced that it is, but I think that's a thing to figure out. Um, React has a really good story for sort of composability with components, uh, but when you get into data and sort of things that are stateful, uh, it gets a little bit trickier. So here's an idea of like how, how we can approach this. Basically, if we have a log and it has all these facts, uh, we can write functions that sort of interpret the lower level bits of this. Like, co cool, get me all the requests related to to-dos, get me all the user actions related to filters and sort of roll those up. And on top of that, we can write functions that then provide entities basically in the sort of domain space that, that the programmer and the user care about. Uh, and this looks sort of like a traditional model object, but it's different. It's just getting computed uh, as we need it. And so ultimately, you want a list of to-dos somewhere, uh, and so this is how we could build it. And then at the far end, we have components who need something specific to show the user. Uh, that's not always directly tied to these sort of like highly normalized pictures uh, of what, what the data is. Uh, and so we can uh, sort of at the far end of the system add a function that sort of merges those bits together uh, and provides exactly what the component needs. Figuring out what the right factoring here is, what the right API, what the right building blocks is tough. Like that's work, uh, I think, to be done. But what's inspiring to me about this and this kind of design and this idea uh, is that this is just function composition. This is the easiest part of figuring out how to sort of get the mechanics of programming out of the way. Uh, and the only hard problem is actually how do we want to model this? What is the core essence of this problem? Uh, so to me, like this kind of design, when we, we have problems like that, we, we sort of set ourselves up in a good place to be successful. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some optimizations. And basically, uh, what I want to do here is sort of convince you uh, that this is not a crazy idea. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of like actually profiling different things. Um, but I want to say that uh, other fields of engineering have similar problems. Uh, and, and just like others here have talked about React being able to take ideas that are awesome in other parts of functional programming and sort of bring them into the mainstream, uh, I think uh, there's opportunities to basically learn uh, from other people here and just apply those ideas. So here's a sketch of what's going on. One thing we might want to solve as a first optimization is bounding the space of the log. If there's lots of things happening in our app, uh, it's cool to say, look, let's record everything, uh, but we kind of can't do that forever. There is a finite, am finite amount of memory that we want to consume. Um, and so the way that uh, basically what we want is this. And so the way other systems solve this, because this is not like a unique new problem that no one's encountered before, uh, is they, they use something called compaction. So um, in Kafka, the way this works uh, is really, I think, applicable to what we want on the UI, where basically it just accepts all the writes, and then async, there's another process. You can imagine this running in a web worker or another thread uh, that goes through and figures out how to compact that log and throw out the bits that are going to least impact what's happening in the user. Uh, so for example, if a user is editing a to-do like 17 different times and revising it, um, you can imagine when it comes time and we, we actually need to like, cut down on the space that we have, we can throw out the, the updates that are from 10 minutes ago and say, well, OK, that's the trade-off we're making. 
And that lets us sort of keep the mental model of everything being immutable and simple um, and sort of solve those engineering bits separately. It's real work um, that, that we need to do, um, but it's a thing we can do. Second, you might look at the diagram on the right with the different components and see, okay, there's some repeated computation here. Uh, and so instead of uh, just directly sending the facts down through components, uh, we can send a, a way to query them. Uh, and then what we can do in this, this optimizer is we can do sort of standard programming practices, especially if we have immutable data, where we can memoize calls to different reducers. Uh, we can keep a cache of that. We need to bound it. You can't sort of memoize for free. Uh, but basically, we can take the hot calls and make it so we don't have to keep recomputing them. Secondly, uh, we can use a snapshot technique to be able to not recompute the entire log every time something changes. This is something we use on backend systems and answers all the time, and it's really powerful. Uh, basically, when you have a log of a bunch of different items, if you're essentially performing a reduce over them, you're going to compute some value. If you save that, next time another event comes in, you can start from that value as your initial state for the reducer and just merge in one more value. Uh, and so these are sort of the benefits of describing reducer, uh, stores as reducers, as pure functions, is you can use them in different ways and plug them together different ways. A final thought here about uh, optimizing compute is sometimes uh, function composition is really, really awesome, uh, but sometimes it's hard to sort of inspect inside what's going on there and figure out how to optimize it further. Uh, and so uh, Project Nuclear JS, I think, has a really interesting take on this uh, that's very simple. Uh, it's very JavaScript-y. Um, about how you can describe uh, chains of computation that give enough information to this optimizer layer to be able to sort of improve performance over time. And if you're looking at this and seeing like, wow, there's tons of information and there's all this stuff, um, you might realize that there's actually enough information here to even optimize the rendering, the should component update that we sort of mentioned earlier. Uh, Joe talked about this a little bit yesterday in his talk with Relay, where Relay has enough information that it can even figure out how to be more efficient than React's awesome top-down uh, diff and reconcile strategy. And so I think here, by doing these kind of approaches, we put ourselves in a position where we can do that work, we can make those optimizations, uh, another sort of aspect of, of good design. Okay, so takeaways for you here today. This stuff is really important. <laughs> We can make really impactful things for people, uh, and they, they expect this more and more, uh, and, and we can do this. Um, it takes collaboration across the stack. I think the Facebook team is a really good uh, model of this, where the things that they're talking about with GraphQL and Relay, you have to sort of have a full stack understanding, or you have to be able to bridge, bridge, bridge gaps between different worlds. Uh, we can't sort of be sandboxed and isolated. And then to do these kind of things, the sort of standard functional programming ideas of recording things in data, interpreting them, and pushing effects out to the edge are super powerful, especially when we're working with async systems uh, and network operations. Uh, and embracing the log has been super powerful in backend systems on my team. Uh, and I think there's a lot of benefits that are directly applicable to UI engineering here, um, and that can let us make all these awesome things for users. Uh, I skipped these, uh, but thanks for having me. Uh, it's been awesome to be here. This conference is super exciting. Come talk to me more if you want to talk about this. I'm very interested. Thanks.